This is David Evan Thomas, and I'm writing a piece for Gitsies, the Greater Twin Cities Youth Symphonies. I've come to the Medicine Bow Mountains in Wyoming to Brush Creek Ranch, a retreat that hosts artists and grants them time and space to do their work. Here's the artist camp from above. I'm part of a particularly jolly group. There are four visual artists, a novelist, a poet, and two composers. And while it was mostly work, there was some strenuous play. Here we are approaching the bunkhouse and the schoolhouse where I'm going to work. The schoolhouse is about a hundred years old and was moved here, especially for the camp. Off in the distance to the left, you can see the creek as you can hear it. It's not too far away. Let's go inside. This is a beautiful little hall. It would seat around 50 or 60 people. It's equipped with a nine foot Steinway. While I'm sitting by the creek here, Brush Creek, thinking about what kind of piece I want to write. I know that Mark Russell Smith has asked for a program opener, so it needs to be something that probably starts big, ends big, maybe in the middle can sing a little bit. I immediately think of the overtures, say, of Berlioz, like Roman Carnival. And those are interesting because the bracing part is pretty short at the beginning. It's only 35 or 40 seconds, and then Berlioz moves into a kind of bel canto mode. And I also know that this piece will be on a program with Appalachian Spring and the very songful Barber Violin Concerto, as well as Faya. And I don't want it to sound too much like Appalachian Spring. I, I love that piece. and have certainly stolen from it in my time. So we'll see what we can do to uh, keep the program varied. I do think I, I want to include one instrument in particular, uh, always been a favorite of mine. This morning I thought I would show you a little about the sketching process that I use. It's probably somewhat individual to me, but uh, I'm sure some other composers follow a similar process. I work always in pencil, on paper. When I'm sketching, I'm trying to put ideas down rather quickly without being too judgmental about them. I just sketched a possible introduction for the piece, and I thought I'd give you a glimpse at that. So here's a, a pencil sketch. Notice it's on a paper that has four lines on it. That's something I can use for orchestral scoring. I can divide it up into two line staves if I want, and that's what you see here. Notice that not all of the notes have stems or beams on them. Sometimes if I know generally what the rhythm is going to be, I'll just put the notes themselves as a mnemonic, a, a way to remember what I was thinking, and then I'll come back later. You can see at the top I've started to fill in durations and a, possibly meter, uh, but I'm not even positive how I'm going to represent that yet. Notice also I'm using some different colored pencils that sometimes I'll use red or blue as a way to make sure that the lines are staying uh, clear to me as I'm going about orchestrating later. So here we are, Brush Creek, day three. And this morning I just had three notes in mind. Very simple. And while I was out by the creek, I sketched a, a expansion of it, something that violins might do. Rhapsody Espanol or Capriccio Espanol sort of thing. So just now I went out, walked to the suspension bridge along the creek. It was only after I'd crossed the bridge many times that I learned that 
the people who designed the bridge had no particular engineering skills. Don't look down. A little later in the day, I took those three little notes and played with them in the form of a chorale, something that is more sustained, perhaps for full orchestra. This is what I came up with. As it turned out, none of the ideas sketched in the first few days made the cut. But those attempts took me where I needed to go. After all, to eat an orange, you first have to peel it or slice it open. A couple days ago, I sketched a little tune. Actually, I thought of it as the big tune, but it's not very big. It is, however, big-hearted, romantic. It goes like this. So it unfolds in three waves, and it has a shape that expands. Uh, now, if you add harmony to it, you might get something like this. And if you've played any Sibelius, you know that that chord turns out to be a supertonic seventh chord. That is, it's a chord that's built on the second degree of the scale with a root, third, fifth, seventh. In this case, it's in first inversion. And Sibelius loves to you know, that's not Sibelius, that's, but that's the kind of thing that you might hear in you know, Sibelius tone poem. Uh, so one of my challenges is going to be to, if I use this tune, to have it not sound just like Sibelius, as much as I love that composer. that supertonic seventh chord? Well, let's spin it out a little bit. Let it do what chords like that like to do, which is often unfolding in the sequence. Something like that. And let's add some woodwind noodling on top of it. Time for a swim. There's a place where Brush Creek takes a right turn. Beautiful little hole for swimming. Oh, there we go. Woo! Yeah! Taking breaks is serious creative business. You've heard of the three Bs. Hans von Bülow was referring to Bach, Beethoven, and Brahms, but one physicist called the three Bs the bus, the bath, and the bed. That's where the great discoveries are made in our science. Here's an idea that could be the subject of a fugal passage. It's up-tempo, 
some offbeat accents. There's even a bit of a sticky damper that creates a resonating high D that probably will figure into the scoring, perhaps as a percussion highlight or something like that. So it goes something like this. slow theme. It's taken on a little bit more of a somber character at first. This could be played by violas with maybe divisi cellos in the background. The accompaniment pattern is a throbbing kind of thing that even though we're in 4-4 four, four time, the pattern itself is a 3-4 pattern and then even at that it's subdivided into uh, two halves of three eighth notes and it's sort of like this. that goes one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three. So a kind of undulating, uh, something to give a little bit of life to the theme. So here's, here it is with the, the theme above it. Let's talk about some of the tools composers use, and there aren't very many because, frankly, the, the tools that you really need are here and here. Of course, pencils are important. Soft lead pencils, number one, or uh, 2B if you're using artist pencils, nice and soft and dark, but also colored pencils. I like to work in several colors if I'm using different lines on a limited number of staves to keep the lines clear. A paper that suits your project. If I'm writing orchestral music, I'll perhaps use a four stave paper. A good ruler is important. Transparency, good. How about a metronome? Essential for indicating tempos and getting tempos right. A good eraser is important, a Statler Mars. I also have a dandy tool, the rotary eraser or electric eraser. Here's the eraser down here. Push the button and it turns around. And I can give a demonstration maybe this way. A time there was, not so long ago, when composers made fair copies with ink on paper or vellum. It was a labor-intensive, often unforgiving process. Here's a page of a string quartet. But it did give a composer's scores an individual character. Of course, the computer has changed all that, for the better, mostly. I especially like this new vertical monitor, which displays a full score page. Well, if you remember the tune that I sketched a few days ago, I thought I would try and see if I could work with it contrapuntally, that is, as several independent lines, each expressing their own melody, but working together to form a pleasing harmony as well. So I did come up with a solution, but it didn't happen right away. It took me some time. So let me show you how I went about it. So first I started with the, that tune. tried playing the tune against itself in a canon, in this case a canon uh, at the fifth. Okay, eh, something. Um, that was in three voices and then a fourth voice came in. I thought I could do better, so I tried again. Well, 
thought was a little different. Started running into some parallels there I didn't like. Finally, on my fifth sketch, I came up with something that I like quite a lot, really. It turns out to be a double cannon. That is, there are two cannons going on. I'm going to play it very slowly, and perhaps you can imagine it forming the background while there's more uh, active material underneath. then we actually get a kind of a climax. So that may be usable later. Uh, what I imagine might happen is that a kind of vigorous counterpoint goes underground, so to speak, like an underground river, and then this uh, string material wells up over it and brings us all to a head. We'll see. piece doesn't get written sequentially from the beginning to the end. That I may start in the middle and go forward a bit. I may start at the beginning and try to go backward, but all of those little starts are essential to finding out what the material is going to do or want to do. So here's an idea. Uh, let's go back to that second theme. which is so much like Sibelius. And let's play a bit with that final chord, which is not final. That is, it suggests something more. Uh, composers have used it to suggest eternity. Mahler at the end of the Das Lied von der Erde. Uh, Brahms, the uh, opening of How Lovely is Thy Dwelling Place in the Requiem. So let's play with it a bit and see where it goes. I'm going to choose an ascending series of notes and just tack on to those notes unrelated chords of this type, which we said was a major minor seventh chord. So here's an ascending series. So what if we just sort of tack onto the line? here. So we've created a non-functional progression that still has direction. And that may be something that I'll want to explore as I move to the coda or someplace just for color. I was a trumpet player in a youth orchestra, and writing this work has prompted memories and a thought. Just as a melody provides an arch or a chord links one idea to another, so are the members of the Greater Twin Cities Youth Symphonies a bridge between cultures and continents, present and future. Mm -hmm. 